As she said, my name's Ann Baker. I'm a certified holistic nutritionist and lifestyle change expert. And I help people with chronic health conditions that many times doctors aren't able to help with. Usually the people that I see have some sort of chronic pain, they have low energy, and they have poor sleep. What I do is work with them on their nutrition and lifestyle uh, and help them make small, simple changes so that they re can reclaim their health. And I am in the Rochester area, uh, and I obviously see individuals and also love doing this type of thing, talking to groups of people. So tonight, we are going to hopefully give you some good information that you can take home and use about how your brain works and how food impacts our moods. So let's get started. Can the food you eat really affect your mood? Dr. Daniel Amen, who's an MD, child and adult psychiatrist, brain imaging specialist, and best-selling author, believes that food is indeed a drug. Dr. Mark Hyman, who's an MD and is considered the father of functional medicine, says that food is information. Well, they're both correct. And we're gonna talk about what happens with food when it goes into our bodies and how it impacts us. Foods and nutrients impact depression and anxiety, stress and cognition and memory. And of course, they affect many other things, but tonight, we're gonna to focus on these areas. You can build a better brain by choosing the right foods. Certain substances enhance the brain and its performance and improve moods, while other substances impair brain performance and mood. So when you know what nutrients your body needs more of, you can help your brain work better. So understanding of food and nutrients selectively can enhance our well-being. Let's get into how our brains work first because it's pretty fascinating and I think many of us really never give it a thought. It just happens. Our brains actually require a constant source of carbohydrates and protein and essential fatty acids to survive. The brain requires 20% of our whole oxygen supply and 50% of all available glucose. And if the brain does not get these for 15 seconds, unconsciousness occurs. And after five minutes, brain death occurs. So what you have here is the brain taking priority over getting nutrients over anything else in the body, over any other organ. I don't think we realize it. I think some people think the heart, they think the lungs, but it's the brain. You remember, this, this brain is what's controlling everything else that we're doing. Key macronutrients are carbohydrates, and these provide fuel for glucose and brain energy, and proteins, which provide fuel for neurotransmitters and performance, and we're gonna go through these and talk about these more, and fatty acids. These are the keys to the lock in neurotransmission for cell signaling and communication. So carbohydrates provide brain energy. And glucose is the fuel your brain uses to produce energy. Glucose is found primarily in carbohydrates. The neurons in our brains cannot store glucose, therefore they depend on a constant supply in our bloodstream. So what are the best carbohydrate food sources? The best carbohydrates are complex carbohydrates that come from low glycemic index foods, and we're gonna talk about what some of those are. Leafy green vegetables and brightly colored vegetables, legumes, whole grains, and fruits like berries and apples. These are good examples of low glycemic index, good glucose sources for the brain. These foods are the best brain sugars because they release slowly, and that's what we want. Studies show that lower carbohydrate intake actually improves cognition which might seem surprising, since I just said the brain needs glucose, right? Overconsumption creates brain fog or mild cognitive impairment, which is actually a 
a medical term. Excessive carbohydrate consumption can actually fuel depression. So I'm going to get into a little bit more of that as we go on. Many people learn to overeat carbohydrates, particularly snack foods like potato chips or pastries, which are rich in carbohydrates and fats to make themselves feel better. This works because neurotransmitters like serotonin, which is made from tryptophan, can actually be taken up better with the help of carbohydrates. But over time, this can backfire. So too much sugar or refined carbohydrates at one time actually deprive your brain of glucose, depleting its energy supply and compromising your brain's power to concentrate, remember, and learn. That's why you often see sleepy people eating a bowl of pasta for lunch, and you feel sleepy after you eat it. The bottom line, our carbohydrates work with other nutrients to regulate mood, but balance is very key. So hidden saboteur number one is that many people with mood disorders actually have an underlying blood sugar dysregulation. It's very, very common. And what I'm telling you is very common in clinical journals uh, and very common knowledge to those of us in the healthcare profession and indeed in my own experience working with people. Now, eating too many simple carbohydrates and not enough protein causes surges and then a sudden drop in blood sugar levels, which you may know as hypoglycemia. Symptoms of hypoglycemia are actually very similar to those of anxiety. So the first thing to look at is blood sugar levels. Now I want to stop for just a second and ask how many people here in the room feel that they personally have an issue with you know, mood swings, anxiety, depression, concentration of focus, or they're here because maybe they have a, a loved one or family member. Okay, okay. What I'm going to tell you is unfortunately not often discussed or addressed by many doctors, and I really don't know why, um, but this is real important stuff, and you can really help yourself out a lot whether you're on some kind of medication or not by following what I'm going to show you how to do here. So simple carbohydrates are actually like a sugar injection. You can really think of that needle going in and just zooming you. That's what's happening. And they're found in processed or refined foods and some natural foods. Simple carbohydrates have short-chain sugar molecules, and they break apart quickly because they enter the bloodstream quickly. So some of these foods are corn syrup, fruit juices, honey, they all contain glucose that's absorbed directly through the stomach wall and rapidly released into the bloodstream. It almost acts as though you've taken a hypodermic needle and just injected yourself with this stuff. Complex carbohydrates are like time releases, time release capsules of sugar. They tend to be in more natural foods like vegetables and fruits. And these foods have cell walls made of cellulose fiber that resists digestion, and this slows the breakdown uh, and release of sugars into the bloodstream. And that's what really makes a huge difference. That's why it's better to eat the piece of fruit than drink the juice, okay? And think of how many pieces of fruit it takes to make a half a cup or a cup of juice. Juice is way too much concentrated sugar for us. Eat the fruit. These foods have long chains of sugar molecules that the liver gradually breaks down into shorter glucose molecules that the brain can use for fuel. So our tip here is to get your blood sugar checked. Fasting blood sugar levels are done at most doctors and they're done at most regular checkups as part of your CBC blood panel work that they do. But I really like the A1C and I wish that they would just routinely do that with everybody because the difference is that an A1C actually gives us a snapshot of what your blood sugar has been over the last three or four months, which I think is much more 
useful information than just getting your levels in the last 12 hours. Because as you know, when most of us go to the doctors, we're really, really good before we get our blood done. And so how accurate is that if you're not really, really good most of the time? So we really want to know what's going on, and be honest here. So hidden saboteur number two, and this is one of the reasons why I wrote my book, <coughs> is hidden food intolerances. These are incredibly common, and these are a giant problem for most people that have mood disorders and cognition disorders and sleep issues and lots of stress. Especially a problematic for depression and anxiety. Brain fog is very often due to food intolerances or yeast overgrowth. And the common foods that trigger reactivity are gluten, dairy, corn, soy, eggs, and nuts. And the problem is, while dairy seems pretty easy to figure out to eliminate it, and eggs do, nuts are okay, but I'll tell you, corn, soy, and gluten lurk everywhere and are used in thousands and thousands of products that you're consuming, and they're used in fillers, as fillers in, um, in meats. So it can be a little tricky to try and figure out where these hidden food intolerance sources are uh, unless you really you know, know where to look. And that's one of the things I do with a lot of people they're, they're, is determine, you know, help them determine where these hidden foods are uh, once we determine what they're reacting to. But, yeast is, uh, but uh, gluten is a real big one. Gut health. This is very related to this. 95% of the body's serotonin resides in your gut. So addressing food triggers is imperative. Now food intolerances and yeast impede nutrient breakdown and absorption of your nutrients. And this is an area that's not addressed by most physicians. So what happens is you have these hidden food intolerances and they're manifesting in a lot of mood issues, depression, anxiety, cognition issues. Let's just name those three. Well, what happens is these are triggering your secondary immune response in your gut. Okay, you have two immune systems. You have immediate and delayed. Immediate is where you get a bee sting and you have, you know, a very severe reaction, have to get rushed to the hospital, maybe have to have the EpiPen, okay, or, you know, a, pe a severe peanut allergy. More common uh, are food allergies, and these are delayed immune responses. They can take up to a few hours or even a few days to show up. And there's a number of symptoms that um, indicate food intolerances. Anything from you know, mild headache, from congestion, joint pain, you may have diarrhea, you may have constipation, you may have psoriasis or acne uh, or rosacea, so, so skin issues. Um, there's many, many ways that they pop up. And oftentimes people just think, well, this is just a sign of aging or this is just, you know, um, just a little surface irritation. Uh, they don't really relate it to the food that they're eating. And doctors don't test for this because when you go to a dermatologist, what they're testing for is a true allergy that's an immediate immune response. But food is delayed, so there's, there is specialized testing that can be done, and it tests for antibodies that your body makes and the reason it happens is because you have gut permeability, which means the walls of the intestinal tract start to become degraded and damaged because uh, your body is not able to properly break down your food. So you get little holes in it. And large food particles travel into the bloodstream. And when that happens, the body thinks that it's being invaded. So it's, it, the immune response starts to kick in and you are creating um, IgG, IgA antibody responses, okay? So that's how those are detected through testing. But doctors do not perform that type of testing as a general rule unless you go to a more holistic or functional type doctor. 
So our tip is restore gut integrity. Food intolerance testing, testing for yeast overgrowth, and checking for intestinal permeability, AKA leaky gut. These tests are best performed by specialized labs. Most MDs don't do these. Again, I don't know why this is not covered in med school. I don't know why this isn't routinely uh, at least suggested or offered up to people, um, but I want you to know about it. So let's talk about protein. Protein helps us with brain performance. Proteins provide the amino acids to make neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters act as biochemical messengers carrying signals from one brain cell to another. Neurotransmitters are made from protein and they're very specialized. Some neurotransmitters are neurons that ignite and perk up the brain. Others have more of a calming or sedative effect. A shortage or overabundance of either impacts your mood. So the food sources of protein, protein is found in all animal products, meat, poultry, fish, seafood, dairy products, and eggs. And vegetarian sources include nuts, seeds, beans, and legumes. And actually, all vegetables do contain a small amount of protein. So amino acids, the building box of protein. There's at least 60 amino acids that we've discovered, and eight of these are considered essential, and two, serotonin and tryptophan, influence the top other four neurotransmitters. Serotonin is one that most people have kind of heard of. Uh, it's made from tryptophan, and it's very relaxing on the brain, and it helps restore the brain. Serotonin is known as a mood regulator, and it's made naturally in the brain from tryptophan with some help from the B vitamins. Low serotonin is a major factor in depression. Most clinically depressed patients are low in serotonin. Serotonin is produced by the pineal gland and is responsible for waking and sleeping cycle, as well as counterbalance for adrenaline and noradrenaline, and prolonged stress reduces serotonin. Okay. Tryptophan. Protein foods contain, contain the amino acid tryptophan help relax the brain. High sources of tryptophan are wild game meat, avocado, cottage cheese, eggs, wheat germ, turkey, and duck meat. And eating a lot of carbohydrates with tryptophan containing food increases the sedative effect. Think about what happens on Thanksgiving. Everybody goes, oh, I'm in a tryptophan coma because I ate all this turkey and stuffing and potatoes. That's why. You're really amplifying the effect with that combination. Adacetylcholine is essential for movement and memory. GABA is helpful in alleviating chronic anxiety as an inhibitory neurotransmitter, and it also aids in concentration. Anti-anxiety medications often target GABA receptors. Adrenaline and noradrenaline promote alertness, activity, and mood elevation. <coughs> Tyrosine is a wake-up amino. It perks up the brain. Eating a meal with fewer carbohydrates and calories but with more protein makes the eater more alert after a meal. So it's found in high concentrations in seafood, turkey, legumes, and tuna. So a salad of legumes and tuna, or turkey, would be the ideal lunch if you want to work and learn in the afternoon rather than drift off. So that's how you can help yourself with focus and concentration. If you want to wake up the brain, eat a high protein lunch and eat the protein before the carbohydrates. The order in which you eat the food also actually has a subtle impact, which a lot of people don't know, so you can utilize that as well. Glycine is an inhibitory transmitter which with the help of GABA, uh, helps prevent seizures in epilepsy. And dopamine is essential for initiating and coordinating libido responses. It's helpful for those with Parkinson's disease. It's actually now being used in a prescription medication called levodopa, which you may have heard of or know someone. If you have someone with Parkinson's, this is the medication they're giving, and what it's doing is it's targeting dopamine receptors. <clears throat> now, Take a drink here.
I'm showing you this diagram, and this is talking about serotonin. However, this is really how medications work. Um, antidepressants, anti-anxiety medications, they don't actually help you make any more, manufacture any more or less of a specific neurotransmitter. What they do is they increase the receptor sites. So you're st still whatever your body is able to make is all you have for those receptor sites to take up. So what ends up happening, and this is true with whether you're, you're, they're acting on dopamine or phenylalanine, which is another one that they often work in with some other uh, uh, neurotransmitters, it, they're not amino acids. They're not, um, they're not helping you, your body make more. That's why after a while they stop working or they change the dose or they give you a different one because they do not help the body make what it's not making enough of. That's what drugs do. They suppress something, they mask a symptom, they don't address the cause. Hidden saboteur number three. Many people with mood disorders have a shortage or imbalance of key neurotransmitters. Duh, right? After what I just said, and now you know how those medications work, that's what the problem is. You don't make enough. You have an imbalance. This means they either don't manufacture enough of or they manufacture too much of some neurotransmitters. So tip is to check the amino acid status. Most doctors don't test to evaluate neurotransmitter production status. Knowing which amino acid you are low in or in excess of can provide valuable insight into proof management. Now, doesn't that make some sense? Doesn't it make sense to know what you're low or high in, right? We do have the technology to do this. We do have the testing, it's there. Fatty acids are the next component of a healthy brain. 20% of the brain is made from essential fatty acids, and these cannot be manufactured by the body. Essential fatty acids need to be drawn entirely from what we eat. We can't make them. And they've been shown to be very beneficial to people that have depression, schizophrenia, and dementia. It's very well documented in um, PubMed Journal. Neurotransmitters are biochemical messengers that carry information from one brain cell to another, sort of like sparks flying across the gap between nerve cells. These rely on fatty acids to enter into the cell. Each cell membrane contains a series of locks. The various messages, messengers carry carriers like prostaglandins and there are neuro, other neurotransmitters are like the keys. So you have the lock and key analogy. The keys and the lock have to match. When the cell membrane is unhealthy because it's made of the wrong kind of replacement fatty acid, the keys won't fit and the brain function suffers. So poor fats. Unfortunately, most packaged products that you're buying have inferior oils. They have oils like soybean oil. Not only is that a very inferior oil, many people are very reactive to it. That's a very common. Uh, any soy products, and soybean oil is in thousands of products. Pick up any salad dressing, it's got soybean or canola oil. Canola oil is another very inferior oil. It's the wrong kind of oil, don't use, don't use those. Okay, you want flaxseed oil, which has to be taken raw, you can't cook with it. You want olive oil, you want extra virgin coconut oil. Those are all very good, healthy oils. So make your own salad dressings. There's another tip, and I have devoted quite a bit uh, a whole chapter that salad dressings and, and marinades in the back of my book for this reason. If there's one thing that you get tonight, it's throw out all your salad dressings and make your own. You'll save a ton of money and you will be giving your body the right essential fatty acids and you will be doing yourself a world of good for your emo emotional and, and mental health. Wrong key in the lock, it won't work. And when we go out to eat, unfortunately, this is what the restaurants are using. And corn oil, ooh, very bad oil, very bad oil. So let's look at the food sources that are good for fatty acids. Seafood, salmon, shrimp, sardines, herring, mackerel, other cold water, wild caught fish and seafood, very good. Seaweed, nori, dulse, wakimi, and blue-green algae. Spirulina, 
it's another green food, very good. Nuts and seeds and oils, flax seeds, chia seeds, macadamia nut, walnuts, almonds, avocados and avocado oil, olive oil, coconut oil, very good for memory, very good. Omega-3 enriched, free-ranged, pasture-ranged, raised eggs, also very good. Hidden saboteur number four. Essential fatty acid deficiencies are commonly overlooked in those with mood problems. Eating the wrong fats impedes cell signaling, also impede formation of hormones and neurotransmitter communication. Now, think about if you are a loved one or depressed, when you're really in a depressed state or having a lot of anxiety, you're kind of like laying on the couch and you're not doing anything. You're not very inclined to prepare yourself anything very healthy. You're probably reaching for prepared foods or junk food at best. Well, you're undermining yourself and making your, your situation worse. So hopefully you will think about that and try and have some of these better food choices on hand and reach for those. Because again, this seems like really basic stuff, but it is really incredible. And I've seen the results of people that have taken this information to heart and they have um, really helped themselves to have a lot less issues. And this is true whether you're on a medication or not. So let's look at some key macronutrients. Macronutrients are vitamins and minerals, and these are required as cofactors. So the vitamins like A, B-complex, C, D, E, and K. And minerals like calcium, chromium, copper, magnesium, manganese, phosphorus, and zinc. The food sources are vitamins and minerals are found in all foods, both plant and animals. Some foods have better nutrition profiles than others. The key is knowing which ones pack the most bang for your buck in terms of mood health. <coughs> Hidden saboteur number five, micronutrient deficiency is extremely common in those suffering from mood disorders. And why? Well, poor dietary intake of vegetables and a preference and over-reliance on convenience foods as a ma is a major contributor, what I just said, right, before this. So the tip is evaluate micronutrient status. Improved testing is available through specialty labs that can assess by measuring lymphocytes rather than serum blood. The advantages of this are this method, method provides a history of your micronutrient status over the last four or five months. It's very similar to getting an A1C. I think it's much more valuable as opposed to serum blood is not a very accurate measurement, first of all, and it's only going to give you a 12-hour window. Depression. People with depression typically have need for more minerals. Here's some real common ones that are deficient. Magnesium, chromium, selenium, and zinc. And they also need more of the B-complex vitamins. Very, very common to find this combination or some variants of this when we test people. This is a chart uh, that shows you some of the common micronutrients that are low or deficient with people that have depression. So you can see, and it tells you what some of them are used for. Folate's the building block for many feel-good feel good neurotransmitters such as serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. Low folate causes poor responses to antidepressant meds. The lower the folate, the more severe the depression is. So these actually, when we replete these with people, once we know what's low, if you are on medications, chances are your medications will work better, you can use less, and you might be able to get off of them. Okay, now, disclaimer, I'm not standing up here telling you not to take your medication, okay? I'm not saying that. Don't do that. If you're on an antidepressant or anti-anxiety medications, those need to be titrated off. You have to be very careful with a lot of those. They're control, controlled substances. I never take anybody off medication. That is out of my scope. I do not do that. So if you want to do that, discuss it with your doctor, get them on board, and then work with somebody who knows how to help you with nutrition 
because, you know, if you're not going to take the medication, that means you have to do something else. You have to take another course of action to help yourself. And this would be my suggestion. Okay? I'm not saying get off your medications. That could be very dangerous. So some of the other ones here, vitamin B2, implicated in depression due to the role in the thiolation re reactions in the brain. Uh, zinc improves efficacy of antidepressant drugs, particularly useful for treatment resistant patients, regulates neurotransmitters. Antioxidants, typically people are low in antioxidant status because, again, they're not eating a lot of fresh produce, which is where we're getting most of our antioxidants, right? So anxiety, these people also are usually low in the B complex, vitamins and D and E, and this, pretty much the same minerals, magnesium, chromium, selenium, and zinc. They also typically have um, deficiencies in serine and choline and carnitine. So here's the same kind of chart on anxiety. Um, let's see which one did it. Chromium, uh, its effect on serotonin transmission may explain its anti-anxiety anti relieving yeah, effect in animal studies. Uh, selenium. Repletion of selenium to normal levels reduced anxiety scores in clinical trials. Some suggest the mechanism of action is due to its role in key regulatory proteins. So this is chemistry. This can be sounding kind of complicated. But the thing to know is that the body knows what to do with when you give it the right food. So that's a great place to start, is giving it the right food. B-complex, very helpful for people with depression, anxiety, and stress. I'm sure most of you have heard, oh, you're stressed, you need more B vitamins. The highest sources of B-complex are primarily found in animal products and nuts. A great high B-complex meal would be salmon, accompanied by lightly steamed broccoli or asparagus, and a tossed salad that includes romaine, lettuce, and spinach, sweet red peppers and parsley, with a flaxseed oil and apple cider vinegar dressing. So here's some of the highest B12 foods. Um, you can see uh, seafood is right up there. Um, yogurt and milk at the bottom. Still pretty good, but the seafood is very, very high. Here is uh, some of the B6 foods that are the highest. Again, you know, the animal proteins are up there. But uh, even eating, you know, something like a sweet potato, sunflower seeds, spinach, banana, those are still pretty good. Vitamin D. Vitamin D deficiencies are common in those with depression and anxiety, too. Exposing your skin to 20 minutes uh, sunshine each day helps your body produce vitamin D. Now, I know it's pretty darn hard here in Michigan <laughs> with this hideous gray, cold, snowy, awful winter. So in Michigan, you know, we really don't get much sun. Oh, I said sub, it should be sun, oops, typo. Um, so supplementing with vitamin D3 is a good idea, and I think this is the one nutrient that the doctors actually sort of finally are getting a clue on. Uh, vitamin D food sources, salmon again, sardines, tuna, milk, eggs. So you can see that you know the protein sources also really have a good um, vitamin profile as well as just uh, you know, being good for you with protein. Anybody that gets your levels checked, uh, you should be, uh, if you're under 60, you should supplement and get your level rechecked every three months. Yeah, under 60. If your levels are low, you might need to supplement with as much as 30,000 IU for 30 days to increase. And the Vitamin D Council now recommends everyone supplement with 5,000 IU of D a day. And unfortunately, they've been trying to get the American Medical Association to adopt this, and I don't know why they won't. But uh, if you go to the Vitamin D Council website, you can read a lot of really good in information about vitamin D. And they actually say in there, we've been trying to get the AMA to, to tell their patients to supplement with 5,000 IU. So magnesium food sources are all leafy greens, things like spinach, kale, Swiss chard, mustard, collard greens, all the lettuces. Nuts and seeds are very good too. 
Uh, dried beans and legumes, also good. Grains, I would say stick to gluten-free, since that could be problematic for other reasons. Avocados are good, bananas, dried fruits, and yes, dark chocolate. Yay. Chromium food sources are asparagus, onions, tomatoes, brewer's yeast, oyster, whole grain, bran cereals, potatoes, black pepper, thyme. Believe it or not. Zinc food sources, pumpkin seeds are actually the highest. Really good, so they're sometimes called papitas, the Mexican ones, very good. Uh, beef and lamb are high, lentils, garbanzo beans, cashews, and quinoa, which is a gluten-free grain. I don't know if you're familiar with that one. It's an ancient gluten-free grain. And turkey. Selenium. Brazil nuts are actually the highest source of selenium. Cashews, walnuts, macadamia nuts are good. Sunflower seeds, sesame seeds, flax seeds. Oysters and seafoods are very good. Um, fish like tuna, halibut, mackerel, beef, chicken, turkey, and mushrooms, believe it or not. Mushrooms actually do have some nutritional value. Stress increases the need for all nutrients. It's because our metabolism accelerates and our body uses up more of everything. Carbohydrates get used up faster and the need for high quality protein increases. Minerals are used up faster. And it also increases our need for antioxidants. So when you're in a stressful situation, I know this is, seems to be counterintuitive to what we do. Most people tend to not eat. Oh, I'm too busy, I'm too stressed out. Well, that's really a, the time when you really need to do self-care and be very vigilant about it and make sure that you are eating at regular interviews and intervals and you are eating good quality meals like we're talking about here. Uh, otherwise, you can end up with you know, other health issues because stress triggers a lot of other more chronic health problems. That's a lot of times people say, I was going along for years and then you know, they come in and they're just a mess, and it's like, well, let's talk about what led up to this, what happened. Tell me about, you know, the events in your life, the stresses in your life, life-changing events. And sure enough, they'll rattle off, well, you know, I lost my job. Or, you know, I got a new boss, and it's just absolutely awful. You know, having trouble in my relationship with, you know, my husband, my wife, whatever, my SO. Um, you know, someone passed away. They moved. They have financial issues, some, some very you know, major life-changing issues, and then they came crashing down with some very serious health issues. So stress is real. It really does impact the body, and oftentimes that's what triggers some very serious health issues. So help yourself when you're under stress and feed yourself well and do self-care. So the right foods under stress, kind of seen a pattern here. Magnesium-rich foods, vitamin C-rich, B-complex-rich, zinc-rich, and some of the uh, adaptogenic herbs are also very helpful too. Elithro ginseng, holy basil, ashwagandha, rhodiola, and ast astrologus are, are good herbs that help. So testing that I'm suggesting, the A1C uh, and the, can be done with your doctor. I didn't really talk about it, but thyroid pan getting a thyroid panel is a good idea too. And I say panel because unfortunately, it's another area where most medical doctors, allopathically trained, do not test for thyroid correctly. You need the panel. You need you know free T, reverse free uh, you know three and four. Um, TSH, and they need to check and see that there's no antibodies there uh, to make sure that you don't have any cognitive autoimmune kind of issues. Thyroid, uh, hypothyroid and is more common than hyper, but hypothyroidism is really very, very common, more common than you realize. And unfortunately, doctors use diagnostic ranges which are very narrow, okay? Whereas what we really should be looking at with everything is optimal ranges. Okay, and uh, optimal ranges, excuse me, they use 
Now, his diagnostic ranges, which are very broad, I said it backwards, um, and what we really should be looking for are optimal ranges, which are narrower. So that's why a lot of times you might fall right on the edges of the ranges, and they say, well, you're, you know, uh, your, your T3 is fine. You're, you know, well, they didn't do the full panel, or even if they do the full panel, they're not really looking at it in the right way, and you still feel really lousy. You still feel tired, you have cold hands, you have dark circles under your eyes, you know, Maybe you have heart palpitations, lots of other things that are common symptomology. So, uh, you know, we really need to be our own advocates here, and we need to be a little more pushy sometimes and talk to our doctors and get some of this better testing done. So thyroid would be a good thing to check because it can really affect our moods too. So you want to make sure your thyroid is healthy and in good operating order, and you might need a little help with a little a thyroid medication. The specialty labs, I do these at my office. Um, these are uh, micronutrient testing, which uh, measures the lymphocytes, which I talked about. There is also amino acid testing, so you can actually see what your status is in terms of which amino acid you might have a lot of or too much of or imbalance. There's also fatty acid testing now, too. And then food intolerance in candida testing as well. Now these tests, you know, range in price from a couple hundred dollars to around four hundred dollars, depending on what you're talking about. Some of them, um, you can, if you get your doctor to to sign uh, the test authorization form, um, it can be submitted for insurance. Now with the new insurance changes, I don't know how much is going to be covered. Um, you can always call. I have these kits in my office. They, some of them require serum blood draw, and they do it at Crittenden, like the uh, micronutrient testing does. Um, amino acid, fatty acid, food intolerance don't. Food intolerance I do with a, a blood spot testing. Um, but um, those are good tests to consider. So in conclusion, any effective mood management program needs to include targeted nutrition. Depletion of deficient micronutrients can help minimize medications and improve the outcome from their treatment. Removing unsupportive foods and replacing them with supportive foods, also very important. And rebalancing and addressing all gut issues also will make a huge difference. So I want to just tell you about book that I've written. It's a recipe collection. It's all gluten-free recipes. Most of these recipes are also free from other commonly reactive foods that we talked about that a lot of people have issues with that don't know it, like corn, soy, and dairy. Um, they're all very anti-inflammatory. It's over 50 recipes in there. And there's a little bit of sprinkling of a little bit of nutrition information here and there. Um, but it's primar primarily a recipe collection. And I'll just tell you my story. I uh, had a series of health crises in my mid-40s. I was a uh, consultant to Fortune 500 companies, and I was traveling a lot, and I was managing the headquarters. And I thought I was eating well. I thought I was taking good care of myself, but oh, I had this back pain constantly right here. And I was going to the chiropractor like three times a week. It just wouldn't go away. Then I was, I hurt my knee and, my, and it was really bothering me. And I went to a specialist and I thought, oh God, you know, am I going to have to have knee replacement surgery or what? You know, I'm not even 50. Well, then I had, my migraines were getting worse and worse. I was having them several times a week and they were just getting more severe. I was missing work. Let's see, I, they found precancerous cells at a, screening that they did for me, and I ended up having to go in and get biopsies done over a period of about a year. I had very bad acne rosacea. My skin was a mess. Um, I thought, geez, I'm, I look like an adolescent again. What's going on? You know, so you go to a dermatologist, they give you a you know, topical steroidal cream for that. They wanted to give me Celebrex for my knee. Uh, they gave me prescription medication for my migraine. 
just started looking up the stuff. Well, the Celebrex, I think I took for not even a week. And I realized how bad it was on the liver. I said, I'm not taking that. Well, then I was changing insurance companies, and the insurance provider said, we got to charge you more for your premium. And I said, well, why? I'm only taking one medication. I just my migraine stuff, and I'm not taking it every day. And they said, well, it's been flagged. It's a, you know, it, I said, why? Well, it increases your risk. And they wouldn't tell me, so I started looking around on the Internet. Now, again, this was, you know, like 18 or so years ago, because I'm almost 60 now. And uh, I saw that this medication that I was on increased my risk for stroke. And I thought, oh, well, I got to find some other way here. This is ridiculous. I'm falling apart. I'm, you know, not even 50 yet. What's going to happen? I'm going to be in a wheelchair or what? So I started on the path to try and figure out what was going on with me. I did see uh, some naturopathic doctors. Uh, you know, I saw. Acu acupuncturists, uh, some other um, body work healers. I tried a lot of different things, and everybody gave me kind of a piece, but nobody was connecting the dots. And I thought, you know, all this stuff's got to be connected. I'm going to have to figure this out on my own. So I decided to go back to school and learn about nutrition because I just knew that at the core, this had to be it. And in my studies, I kept having aha, aha, as I was reading things, thinking, whoa, that's me, that's me. Oh, my gosh, I can't believe it. That's what's going on. So I started trying this stuff on myself, and it started to work. And I thought, you know, if I can do this much with myself, what can I do with other people? So that clinched it for me, and that's why I am doing what I'm doing. And I can tell you that it works because I don't have knee pain. I don't have back pain. That was my adrenals, by the way screaming at me. Um, I don't have leaky gut. I had horrible candida yeast overgrowth. I don't have that anymore. My skin looks pretty good now. Okay. Don't have any foundation on, lady. <laughs> I'm telling you. Um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty close to 60, and I feel pretty darn good. So the stuff works. I'm living proof. And um, I hope that, you know, what I share with you tonight you got a little pearl here and there that maybe you can apply and use. And if you, you know, do need more help, I can work with you. And I am going to extend to you a special offer tonight. If you do want to work with me, I do have a six package program that would be uh, a good starting point for most people because it takes a little while to make these changes and actually have new habits develop. So if you sign up with me tonight, I will extend uh, a $75 savings on that. So that would be $525 as opposed to $600 for my normal package price. Uh, but you would need to sign up with me tonight and make your first appointment. <coughs> you wouldn't need to pay until you came in for that. but. It needs to be, you know, an appointment that happens in the next couple of weeks. So if you are thinking about it, you're on the fence, this is a way to, you know, save a little bit of money and get started. Uh, the package includes a very comprehensive intake appointment, which is 60 to 90 minutes. And then there's a 45-minute follow-up after that, and then four 30-minute uh, maintenance visits uh, and, you know, making adjustments to what we're doing for monitoring and and coaching and that kind of thing. And we would talk about, you know, if you wanted to investigate any of the specialized testing. Um, and, you know, what we could do to help with uh, any repletion issues that you might have. So that concludes my talk tonight. I will be happy to take some questions and, if you, you know, have questions about the book. The book is $19. I do take credit cards. Um, as well as cash and check if you're interested. You're welcome to come up, take a look at the book, see if it looks like, you know, uh, something you're interested in. If you're a person that thinks health food tastes like cardboard and doesn't like vegetables, you'll actually probably be pretty surprised. That there's a lot of stuff in here that actually is pretty tasty and easy to make. Any questions? Yes, sir. What about, uh, what about DNO? Kind of, kind of oh, yes. Genetically engineered foods, for sure. Uh, genetically modified foods. There's actually uh, quite a lot of new research coming out. A gentleman named Jeffrey Smith, who uh, has done um, 
a book and a film called Seeds of Deception, and you can also go to Institute for Responsible Medicine and find a lot of documentation there that uh, these GMOs are actually changing and altering the etiology of our gut, uh, which what that means is um, a lot of people now are thinking that a lot of the rise in autoimmune issues plus, of course, things like food intolerances too are, are escalating because of the genetically modified organisms. Now, you know what those are, right? Do people know what those are? And do you know what the most common foods that are genetically modified? Corn is very high. Soy, all genetically altered, okay? Uh, wheat, genetically altered too. Actually, cotton is unfortunately now very gen genetically altered. Canola oil completely as a GMO product. Um, so you want to stay away from those. And again, when you're reading you know, the labels, uh, if it doesn't say organic, it's genetically modified. So, and I, I, it just breaks my heart that our wonderful sweet corn in the summer, GMO'd. It's very hard to find organic corn. Well, the problem is the seeds. And you know, now what we have going on, every time the wind blows and the, of course the insects and the birds and everybody are doing their thing pollinating, it's cross-contamination. This is, this is the problem, it's an epidemic. You know, they, uh, and they're feeding this to our animals, our livestock, okay? So <clears throat> if we're not buying organic pasture raised where you know, you know that they're not using the GMOs, we're getting them through the animal products, whether it be the meats or the, ch or the cheeses, you know, the dairies, eggs and stuff. So um, we really need to stand up and demand labeling because people, you know, were able to see what was genetically altered. The, you know, uh, supply and demand, people wouldn't buy it, and pretty soon they would stop doing all this. You know, it'd be the con the the, uh, the um, free market at work. Yes, sir, you've had your hand up. I will tell you that, um, boy, if you email me, I will email you the research on that. The way the study, it's all in the way the study was done, they cherry picked. Because um, actually I had a client that emailed me about that and I sent him three or four links. So I'd be happy to do that. Just email me and just say, you know, regarding the, the vitamin study, would you please send me those? And these are from um, very well respected doctors that are. Uh, in functional medicine that I happen to follow that, you know, are, they know what they're talking about. Yes, ma'am. Probiotics you can get through, you know, dairy and kefir. Uh, any of the fermented foods are really good too. You're going to get some good enzymes there. Apple cider vinegar, any naturally fermented like kimchi, or if you make your own sauerkraut, you make it the traditional ways. But when we are talking about most people, most Americans who eat the standard American diet, the sad diet, okay, um, your guts are pretty messed up. They're pretty far off. So where doctors are using prescription medications to basically put a Band-Aid on and address a symptom, or you know, to, to mask a symptom or just take care of a symptom, in the holistic area, we use food and we use targeted nutrients to actually provide the body something that it either can't make or doesn't have enough of or it needs to be balanced on. And probiotics is one of those things where I'm a real advocate of taking probiotic every day. I mean, I do eat yogurt, I do eat kefir, you know, I use apple cider vinegar and some other fermented foods, but I still take a really high quality um, multi-strain probiotic every single day, and I have for years, because I have had such trouble in the past with my gut, I do not want to ever have that again. And 80% of our immunity resides in our gut. So if you keep a strong gut, you are going to have, your body's going to have a better chance of fighting off, you know, any kind of viruses, including things like, you know, uh, the flu virus, H1, that they're saying is now a strain. So I really advocate for supplementation as well as the food. 
And unfortunately, most of the supplements that are in the health food stores are not very good. They're not strong enough. They're not potent enough. Um, so that's, you know, that, that's why I, you know, I use a, a clinical product because um, I'm kind of a nut about that because of my own problems. Yes? Right. Okay. Um, wild caught is preferable because the fish are actually eating what they are naturally eating in the, you know, in the wild. They're eating little um, plants and little little tiny maybe other little fish and crustaceans. So they are getting good omega three profile foods into their bodies. Okay, that's one thing. The second thing is farm raised are being fed corn and soy. You know it again. These are not natural foods for fish. Fish don't eat this. And they're also being kept in, you know, uh, pens, more confinement. And there can be, you know, uh, concern for infection. So they are given antibiotics. Um, so we have, you know, we, we, we're doing the same thing with the fish farming that we did with the commercial livestock farming. You know, we just, we keep just messing this up, or the powers that be do. Um, so that's why it's more expensive and it's better. Now, I do want to mention people are concerned about mercury. Interesting that if you get, you know, fish that is the colder varieties that we mostly talked about here, the halibut, the salmon, the mackerel, those are better fishes. You know, you can go to, um, gosh, I can't, think, can't think of the name of the website right now that uh, talks about sustainable, um, sustainable fishing where that's not overfished and that's actually lower in mercury. But uh, wild fish also contain natural selenium. So selenium binds to mercury in your body. So when you're getting a wild caught fish, you're actually also getting in that package some protection because that fish has selenium that's going to help bind any mercury that's in there, okay? I, I don't eat any red meat. I eat a ton of fish and seafood, uh, you know, and organic poultry, and I've been doing that for over 40 years. So um, you can have your metals levels tested too. Hair analysis is generally considered one of the best ways to do it. But um, I think the health benefits outweigh the risk uh, of eating the wild. Yes? No. You don't want to drink soy milk. You don't want to... Soy is an, what's called an endocrine disruptor, so it disrupts our glandular system. It's particularly damaging to the thyroid, okay? We've been really sold a bill of goods here about how healthy soy is. It's not. The Asians do not consume soy in the amounts we've been led to believe. It's a $90 billion, $900 billion industry, and the soy industry has figured out how to use every conceivable piece of that plant. It's a great book written by a colleague of mine and a, a well-known doctor here called The Soy Deception. And it's written by Dr. David Brownstein and uh, Cheryl Scheinfeld, who is also a certified nutritionist like I am. And it's a very good book that really lays it all out. I would stop immediately, you know, go to coconut milk, go to almond milk, um, don't drink. Coconut? Almond? No, almond's not soy. It's, all, it's from almonds. Yeah, almond's better. Soy, I would not touch. The Asians actually use a small amount of fermented soy. They don't, they, so I mean things like miso and tamari. Uh, they would use um, tempeh is another fermented soy product. But they're not um, huge staples. I mean what they have done in this country is they're pushing the soy milk and they're using soy as a filler product. Unfortunately, I see vegetarians that are eating all these veggie burgers, and they are just—they just feel so bad. They feel terrible. Well, first of all, they're not getting, 
and they're low in B12 because they're not eating the animal products and they're not supplementing. And second of all, they're eating all the soy and they're screwing up their thyroid. So it will destroy your thyroid. You do not want the soy. Mm -hmm. um, there is, you know, yogurt made from cow's milk dairy. There's also coconut milk now, coconut milk uh, uh, yogurt, and you can also find almond milk yogurt too. So they're a little harder to find. You probably have to go to like a health food store, like you know, Whole Foods, to find those others. Um, just different ones. Yes, ma'am. What do you want to know about wheatgrass? I don't think it's the panacea that people have made it out to be. If wheatgrass, if you have a, if you have a gluten reactivity, you don't want to have wheatgrass. There are better green foods than than wheatgrass. Well, it's still wheat. If you have a gluten sensitivity, you don't want anything that has gluten in it, and wheatgrass is a gluten-containing grain. So I would not consume it. You know, there's other better green foods. I would do a spirulina. Um, I think that's, you know, a better choice. I would do a blue-green blue algae. Those are, those are good. Any kind of the leafy greens, uh, if you're juicing, you know, Swiss chard, kale, um, lettuces, spinach, those are all good. Broccoli. Um, and, you know, again, there is something to be said for juicing, and then there's something to be said for actually eating uh, the vegetable. You know, when we eat the vegetable, if we chop up in a Vitamix or whatever, or we just eat it, we're getting the fiber too. So there's value there. The juicing, we're just extracting the juices. So you want to be careful when you're doing that. Some people make the mistake of juicing, and they're juicing a lot of the fruits and not really the green. You want to just do the green foods with, um, you know, an apple or a carrot in there for sweetness. Because otherwise, what you're going to do is you're going to mess up your blood sugar, and you're going to, you know, subject yourself to potentially... Um, you know, having sugar dysregulation issues. So you've got to be very careful about how you do juice. More vegetables as opposed to fruits. Yes. Um, what about additives like uh, food coloring, the atropine, and the growth inhibitors? Huh, yes. Stay away from those. Those are very, they're called neurotoxins. They actually... Um, excite the brain and they kill the brain cells. So you want to stay away from all those artificial things. And actually many people that have you know, autism, Asperger's, any in the, anybody in those spectrum, um, they have found that they are so, so sensitive to those types of foods. Pulling them out makes a giant difference in their quality of life. Um, so yes, we don't need those things. Stay away from them. If you stick to you know, the whole foods like we were talking about tonight, you're not going to be getting those, you know. You're, that's what I'm saying, you know. <clears throat> if we just get back to the garden again, you know, that was a song, wasn't it? Wasn't there a lyric in a song? I'm dating myself. Um, we're we're going to be a lot healthier. Yes, sir. Well, things like V8 fusion, they are juiced and bottled so long and sitting there before you ingest them, the content of the, the vitamins and minerals in there is very questionable to me. You know, if you want to get into juicing, you know, it really is better to invest in a juicer and, you know, do it yourself and use, the other thing is, you know, are they organic vegetables? Probably not. Um, so. The vitamin water is, you know, you don't, you don't need that. It's really kind of, you're paying for expensive water. Um, you know, you'd be better off to just drink plain water and, you know, eat better. Eat, eat more vegetables and eat more fruits because you're going to get more of a complete uh, nutrient-dense product through the food than you are in the vitamin water. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> And it blends up. It blends right. It blends a juicer extracts the juice. So you, you have like all the pulp and, um, 
you know, fibrousness from whether it's the broccoli or a carrot or an apple or whatever, and just gives you the juice. Any kind of, you know, high-powered blender like a Vitamix or a, a Bullet is another one. There's a bunch of them or the Veggie Max or whatever they call it. That's like a high-powered blender and you're getting all the fiber in it. They do two different things. Some people are like, oh, you know, juicing, I won't juice. I use the other. Other people are like, I love the juicing and I don't do the other. So there's, there's pros and cons to each. <coughs> yes? Splenda's no good either. There's a, a great, like, 45-page, I have it, I can send it to you if you want, called Splenda. Mm -hmm. it, it talks about how it's actually derived from um, a pesticide. That's what Splenda's derived from. So Stevia would be good, and you can get that in, you know, powdered packet, little packets. You can also get it in liquid. Um, you know, you could use some raw honey. Um, and, you know, eating local raw honey is a really great thing if you have any seasonal allergies because it, it helps you to build up natural immunity because the, if you get it from a local bee farmer, um, those bees are flying around pollinating, uh, you know, the plants in our area, and it uh, helps to reduce your seasonal allergy symptoms. So raw honey would be good. Um, those are probably the two best. I mean, you know, on occasion I'll use a little real maple syrup. Um, the, biggest, the biggest thing is to, you know, <clears throat> try and minimize those things. and Don't have them every day. Uh, and, you know, the more we eat those sweet type foods, the more we want them. Mm -hmm. So if you can, you know, even get through like two or three days where you just really abstain, you'll be surprised how much your taste buds for that diminish. And you won't feel like, I just need something sweet, you know? So, anybody else? Okay, lady in the back there. Um, well, you know, our tap water, they're telling us that it's okay. Getting some sort of a filtration system on your home water is a good idea, depending on, you know, what your budget can, a lot, can afford. Um, a lot of people swear by, you know, res reverse osmosis and that type of thing. There's uh, other systems out there that use magnets. Um, you know, there's just like the Pure or the Brita picture or the, the, the little uh, apparatus that goes on your faucet that has you know, a little bit of charcoal filter and stuff. Some kind of filtration is better than none. Um, bottled water we have to watch even though they're telling us that you know, they've uh, removed the polyfluorocarbons. There's now a whole branch of thought saying, yeah, but there's, they're not that much better. You know, I am drinking a, a bottle of water tonight. Sometimes it's impossible not to, you know. Um, so it's, it's one of those questions, you know. <laughs> um, try, and, try and use some sort of filtration system. So, okay, we're gonna, I'm going to only take a couple more questions here. This lady hasn't asked a question. Yes. You know, you'd have to ask, but you know, when you go out, and when you buy a, bur a packaged burger, you know, look look at the ingredients in there, and you'll see some fillers. Yeah, for sure. Prepared products, they you know, it extends the meat, so they they use these fillers. They might use corn too. But gluten is very, very common, um, you know, to hold anything together. It helps to hold what together. Um, Institute for Responsible Technology is one. And then you can also go to Environmental Working Group is another one that's really good. You want to look at uh, Jeffrey Smith. Look him up. Um, some great books and uh, films that he's done. He works, actually I think he works with both of those organizations now. He was with, um, he was with uh, Institute for Responsible Medicine. I think he's now doing some things with Environmental Working Group too. Um, you can go to Organic Consumers Association too. That's another one. 
Um, you can go to Pesticide Action Network, and they actually have a whole section. If you just put in Google, what's on my food, you'll go to a, it'll take you to a website, and it will, oh God, you'll never want to eat again. If you go look there, it's so terrible. It'll show you all the stuff that's on, you know, peas, you know, and then there's the, you know, 25 things because of the pesticides that they use. It's just, you know, we, we really got to take our food supply back. So, you know, it's, it's important. So, well, thank you very much. I'm getting waves in the back. We need to go.